Okay. We're recording. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the bi weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Um, today, it's our privilege to have senior PhD student Ennis Goloszewski speak about some of his work on um, formal methods analysis of cryptographic protocols, looking at an interesting, somewhat obscure protocol, SBP, Session Binding Proxy Protocol, um, which provides a um, interesting solution to some legacy security problems in systems such as Blackboard. Um, as always, we'll be posting the video of this talk on the CDL website. We'll be back in a week, October 6, when uh, UMBC's RJ uh, will talk about some of his um, recent work. And then on October 20th, uh, Josh Benelow from Microsoft will speak about um, his new election guard system, which is going to be used in the November election in the city of um, College Park, Maryland. I'd also like to uh, point out that we have um, positions available in the SFS Scholarship for Service uh, Cybersecurity Scholarship Program, and I encourage you to apply. Um, it's a it's a very big award um, covering tuition and a stipend of about $27,000 per year, plus about $6,000 a year in professional expenses. And in return for each year of support, uh, you have to work for government, either federal, state, local, or tribal. If you're interested, um, uh, please talk to me. Uh, you can apply online through UMBC Scholarship Retriever. There's more information about the scholarship program on the UNBC Cybersecurity Center webpage. Okay, so Ennis, uh, please proceed. Let me get some slides up. Okay, how does that look? Looks good. Okay. Hi, I'm Anis Kolashevsky. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm, I'm working with Dr. Alan Sherman and Dr. Ed Sigler in the Cyber Defense Lab. Today, I want to talk to you about what Alan stated was a somewhat obscure protocol, and that's not an understatement. So, SPP is a very neat little protocol, and we're going to look at a formal methods analysis of this protocol with a focus on the. Uh, there's somebody with a hot microphone. I think dialing in. Please mute your microphones. Okay. So we're specifically when we talk about SBP or the session binding proxy protocol, we're looking at a phenomenon known as oblivious protocol participants, which is a sort of fun idea that we'll get into. I want to point out that this work has sort of been the continuation of a work started by a master's student in our lab. So we were looking for interesting protocols for students to analyze and a master's student, Kirillus El Saad, took a look at this protocol. And he wrote sort of, he wrote a little master's thesis on it that looked at some of the aspects of, um, of how the cookie gets handled in the browser, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, we've since continued to work on this protocol as it's somewhat fascinating from the perspective of formal methods analysis. Let's get into it. So I'm going to use a somewhat extreme example to introduce and motivate the idea of wrapper protocols. So let's tell a little story here. Imagine somebody, and this is hopefully not you, is communicating over the internet with a legacy system. And this is unfortunate organization to the left here that is, for whatever reason, running a web app on, let's use a really extreme example, Apache HTTP 1.0. So this is from 1995. So imagine that you have this on your network and the people need to talk to it to do their jobs. There are some issues with this that should immediately crop up, right? So one of the problems is that probably if you went diving for CVEs and practical exploits against Apache HTTP 1.0, including things like cookie-based session hijacking or 
even just breaking the crypto, depending on how it's using it. There might be somebody on the internet, that is to say between you and that server that can exploit sort of the legacy nature of this communication. And sort of the simple solution to this problem is, well, just get rid of the server. But quite often, especially if you're familiar with sort of maintaining legacy or third-party software for organizations, that Apache server from 1995 might be absolutely critical. That is to say, there might be people whose jobs depend on that system existing and being there. And this now creates a huge, huge problem for everyone involved. And again, if you are communicating with an Apache server from 1995, over the internet, you should assume that that probably isn't going to work very well cryptographically. So what do we do about this? There's a sort of common approach that we're seeing in industry and in organizations actually across every, basically every category, which is that if you have a legacy system like this that must exist, you're gonna shove it behind some sort of firewall proxy combo and try to control access to that machine and also potentially augment the problematic protocols and, and processes that it uses. And we call something like this a wrapper system. So whenever you have a component on your network that you need to isolate and control access to this way so they can keep working, even though you know it's flawed, you know that if somebody can communicate directly with it, it's going to cause problems. And you know that communicating with it in and of itself is a liability. You can wrap it basically with what is sort of a shield. So in this case, you have a firewall and proxy that's going to control communications and regulate communications with this legacy system. Now, the most interesting aspect of this kind of setup is that this legacy system here, so this Apache server, has no idea that it's in this arrangement. And this is what we call an oblivious protocol participant. So if you have a protocol that wraps a system like this, the system you're wrapping generally doesn't know it's taking part in the protocol. And in, a, in the formal method space that creates, let's say, some issues. And we're going to talk about those issues very soon. I want to briefly go over the agenda of what I want to discuss with you today. So I'm going to introduce to you the session binding proxy protocol. We're going to remove the mystery and the mystique from this obscure protocol. Then we're going to look at how we can analyze this protocol formally. What cookie authenticity means in the context of SVP. And I'll just briefly discuss some of the issues facing SVP and similar protocols, and we'll talk about the next steps in the space. So the session binding proxy protocol, this is an obscure protocol from 2013 that several researchers at a university developed to solve a very practical problem they were having. So at the university, they had an instance of Blackboard. Now at UMBC, we also use Blackboard. So this should maybe bring some alarm bells, but not too many. And the issue they are running into is via a cross-site scripting attack and some of the form fields on Blackboard, people were able to steal session cookies and then use those session cookies to authenticate as those uh, authorized users on Blackboard. And this is a pretty big problem if you imagine yourself authenticating as, say, a professor who can modify grades freely and access PII or any number of, the other, any number of other roles available on Blackboard. So the goal of SVP is to prevent this type of session hijacking. And the way we're gonna prevent this kind of session hijacking is we're gonna use a concept called cryptographic binding. This is say we're specifically gonna use cryptography to bind the session cookie to the session communication channel, which we establish using transport layer security or TLS. So the key ideas are we're gonna bind the cookies and we're going to use SBP to wrap a system. So we're not going to modify Blackboard. In fact, we can't. That's one of the motivating factors of developing SBP. If we can't modify the system, we have to wrap it with something. That's basically our only choice. So I think that SBP in this sense is quite well motivated. And we should be interested in protocols like this. Despite the fact that this is obscure, I think what it's trying to do is a common need. And there are likely more of these protocols out in the wild, and there will be more of these protocols in the future. So SVP, by the way, mirrors the setup I showed you before. We have an application server. This is going to be legacy software or third party. And then we're going to wrap it using the SVP protocol, which comprises primarily the session binding proxy. And the proxy is going to be the only entity, ideally, that can communicate with this application server. And it'll be the proxy that's in charge of binding the cookie and achieving the other SVP security goals. 
So SPP comprises three phases of communication as a protocol. You have a phase where you're establishing a key. This is actually just traditional TLS. So if you're familiar with transport layer security, you're actually using it to attend this talk right now, probably. Uh, that is to say your browser should have a key in the top left, a key, uh, sorry, a lock, and that lock will show you information about the certificate you're using. So we are using this end-to-end -end encryption that is TLS. So SVP relies on TLS, which is quite widespread. That is to say, like every modern browser basically supports it. The second phase of SVP is session establishment, where we're going to establish a session between the client that wants to communicate with the application server and the application server. And then last but not least, once we have that session established, we're going to handle the client requests. And a client request might be like, hey, let me stream this talk, you know, from WebEx. This is a great example, right? So WebEx could be a system that you wrap like this, for instance. So as I just stated, phase one of SPP, which is in this box up here, this is going to be an instance of TLS. When we modeled and worked with SPP, we were using TLS 1.2. TLS 1.3 is currently the state of the art. It doesn't change the way SPP works. I just want to point that out. And then phase two is where we get into the actual nitty gritty of SPP, which is session establishment. So traditionally, when you're have a client, when you're having a client authenticate with a web server, the client will communicate directly with that server. In this case, we now have this reverse proxy. It's called a reverse proxy. Reverse proxy because it's primarily proxying the traffic between the server and the proxy, not the other way around. And that proxy is going to stand in for the server when the client communicates. So the client, to, start, to initiate the protocol, the client first is going to negotiate a TLS 1.2 session with the proxy. And the result of that will be that there's a client write key and a proxy write key. These are, these are secret keys we can use to encrypt communication messages. In phase two, we're now going to establish an SVP session. And the way that works is the client is going to send a message to the proxy. In that message, the client is going to state, this is a login request. Here's my username and my password for the application server. That is to say, whatever server the proxy is wrapping. So already we're giving the proxy an enormous amount of trust, by the way, because the proxy will, for each SBP session, know the user's username and password. The proxy now will forward this request to the server. The server receives this request, but to the server, the proxy appears as the client because the server is an oblivious protocol participant, remember? So the server receiving this request from the proxy is going to generate a session cookie, and it's going to send that cookie to the proxy. This is assuming the username and the password are correct, but we're going to assume that's the case here. The proxy now has to do the heavy lifting of the protocol. It's going to create this key K. And key K is a hash of the TLS master secret for the TLS session between the client and the proxy. By the way, the TLS master secret is a piece of secret key material from which we establish the client right and the proxy right keys. Likewise, the proxy also maintains a private system key. That is to say a key that is known only to the proxy. And it's going to hash that together with the TLS master secret, which is specific to this TLS session between the client and the proxy to create this key K. Now we complete the main task of this protocol this bound cookie, or what I call BC here. BC is an encryption of the cookie under key K. And what we do when we encrypt this cookie under key K is that we bind it to the TLS master secret and to the system prior to key. And this is the, this is the binding part of the protocol. And additionally, the proxy will also generate a fresh random value, which is an initialization vector or IV. And to complete phase two, the proxy will respond to the client with the login response the initialization vector and this bound cookie. And remember, this, all this information is going across this TLS channel. So presumably, an eavesdropping adversary doesn't get their hands on this stuff. So one thing that's interesting here in, immediately is that the client and the proxy are both aware of the SPP session. In fact, they're sending SPP specific messages. But the messages between the proxy and the server actually resemble vanilla web traffic. That is to say, the way the client might communicate with the server if the proxy wasn't there. So that means that is to say, the proxy does not know 
sorry, the server does not know it's participating in SPP, reiterating this idea of an oblivious protocol participant. So we now move on to phase three. So in phase three, we assume that we've already completed the first two phases, and we're now gonna handle requests from the client. So whenever the client wants to make a request, say access a website or download a resource or any number of other things you do with web servers, they're going to send the request along with the initialization vector they received in phase two, and crucially this bound cookie. The bound cookie is now the way that the client authenticates with the proxy. Whenever the proxy receives a bound cookie, it's going to decrypt the cookie using this key K that it established in phase two. If the decrypted cookie matches the original cookie from the server, we know that this is the bound cookie that we originally sent out. And if that is the case, then, then and only then do we forward the request to the server along with the original cookie, which the server is gonna to need to accept that authentication as well. Because remember the server still thinks they're talking directly to the client. So any message from the proxy to the server has to resemble the messages from the client. If the server is satisfied with the cookie, it sends a response to the request, which the proxy then passes back onto the client. So all in all, not a super, super complicated protocol, but a quite novel application of cryptographic binding to try and solve this sort of legacy third party system liability. So let's explore sort of what the issues with this might be. So when we talk about formal methods analysis of SPP, what we mean is we're going to specify a formal model of the protocol, which we do using strand spaces. I'll talk about that on the next slide, I promise. And we pass those strand space models to a tool called the Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer, or CPSA. At UMBC, we actually, within the CDL, we may have a protocol analysis lab, or PAL, where we teach people how to use this tool. And in fact, this entire project spawned from a student learning to use the tool and sort of finding this protocol interesting. So for those of you who are interested, this semester, starting in October, I'll be teaching CPSA through a series of workshops that are open and free for anybody to attend. And what you'll learn is you'll learn to use CPS. You'll learn how to specify these models. You'll learn how to run CPSA on them, and then you'll get these shapes. So CPSA's principal output is these shapes. Now I'll show you examples of shapes, but basically shapes within the strand space model describe ex possible executions of a protocol that are, that are complete. And the nice thing about these shapes is we can extract from them security goals using CPSA, and then we can use the tool to prove if those goals hold. So this is a very powerful tool. And it's one of many formal methods analysis tools for protocol security. You can also use things like Tamarin Prover, Profleaf. There's lots of tools to pick from. We like CPSA because we have experts uh, right in our lab and the tool is somewhat easier to teach in my experience than the others. So strand spaces are a relatively intuitive way of representing communication on a network. I wanna start with emphasizing what kind of network we're communicating on. So one of the concessions of strand spaces is we basically make the network the worst case scenario. So this is what's called a dolov yao network or a DY network. It's a concept dating back to 1983, back when sort of network protocols were still in their infancy. And what it basically states can be summarized in one idea. The adversary is gonna deliver every message for you. And that's really powerful. That means that you're handing every single message in your protocol to the adversary. The implications of that are pretty staggering, right? It means that cryptography is basically your only defense against an adversary that's gonna manipulate, decompose, recompose these messages. And the other thing you have to consider is that anybody you communicate with on the DY network could also just be a subsidiary of the network itself. So you might talk to the adversary on purpose. This may seem unrealistic, but how often do you check the reputations of the websites you visit? So in reality, we constantly are talking to entities that we may or may not want to trust and that we don't know much about. When communicating in a DY network, which is a pretty realistic model in some sense, we're basically hurling messages into the network and hoping that the network delivers them to the right place. Now the network could just deny every message, but the DY adversary is generally not interested in doing that, interested in doing that. What the DY adversary wants to do is to manipulate the protocol to create what are called protocol interactions or protocol interference between two different sessions. And these are man in the middle attacks, by the way. And going forward in these figures, any black node 
is going to indicate a transmission of a message. Any blue node will indicate a reception. So modeling, we're going to model three of these variations in the strand space model for, for how to deploy SPP. That is to say what the relationship of the proxy and the server are going to be. So the reference implementation of SPP in the paper very sensibly embeds the proxy with the server. That is to say, the two entities are one entity on the network. Uh, we believe that this is the best way to deploy this protocol. And so this is a good decision by them. However, the protocol specification, well, I use specification here loosely, the description of the protocol in, the, in their paper enables sort of these other deployment methods as well. So we also look at a standalone proxy. So this is where the server and the proxy are distinct network entities. And we're going to look at two configurations of this, one where we're communicating between the proxy and the server over a public network using MTLS. So this would be like a remote setup. And this, this can be pretty dicey, right? Because this means a DY adversary can interfere with the messages between these two entities. And then we're going to look at the standalone proxy model where we're on a private network. Let's say the adversary cannot manipulate messages between the server and the proxy. So let's take a look at some shapes. So when, whenever we're analyzing protocols using CPSA, we tend to analyze them from a certain principles perspective. In this protocol, the interesting perspectives are the client perspective and the server perspective. This is a shape resulting from running CPSA against an embedded proxy model. And it's from the client perspective. Notably, this is the only class of shape that exists for running CPSA against this model, which is good, because what we'll see in the shape is that this actually pretty much looks like how we want the protocol to look when it executes. So to summarize, the client and the server negotiate a TLS 1.1.2 session, and the client sends this encryption of a login, username, and password under the client write key to the server. Bear in mind, this is the server with the proxy embedded. So this is not an oblivious protocol participant. That's key. So this server generates the fresh client cookie, creates this key K by hashing the channel information together with the system private key, and then binds the cookie by encrypting C under key K. So the server is now doing everything. And the server then responds to the client, including this bound cookie. And then, you know, we can complete a request using this bound cookie as follows in the last two messages. So this is great. If we deploy the protocol like this from the client perspective, it looks wonderful. No problem. Let's see how things continue to look as we keep going. So these shapes, by the way, are going to get more and more complicated, and you're probably going to have to squint more and more as you go. So don't feel like you have to ingest everything on the screen. I'll do my best to summarize it for you. So if we introduce the proxy as a third principle in this protocol, we now have a really interesting resulting shape. And the reason it's interesting, and this is, by the way, when you're dealing with a private network, so the communication between a proxy and server is not privy to the adversary. And this is still from the client's perspective. So what the client can know about the protocol, basically. And what's fascinating about the shape is that the shape resembles one-to-one -one a man in the middle attack. And that makes sense. The proxy is actually acting in the capacity of a man in the middle, right? Proxies often do. And what we end up here with here is the client and the proxy negotiate a TLS 1.2 session. And the proxy and the server are going to negotiate this MTLS session. So this is mutual TLS. That's important. So TLS by default actually only authenticates the certificate issuer to the, to the requester. So by default, we don't have certificates. So whenever we are using HTTPS with a website, say with WebEx right now, we receive a certificate from WebEx that we check using the certificate store in our browser. But we never give WebEx a certificate. WebEx actually has no idea who we are. So it's one-way authentication. It's unsumable, right? So MTLS, both people issue certificates to each other. It's actually a better way of doing authentication, but the practicality of giving every last user on the internet their own certificate is still sort of in question. So the proxy and the server have this MTLS session between them. And now the client's going to begin communicating with the proxy using the client write key, CWK, as an encryption key. And the proxy is going to you know, forward these messages to the legitimate server and receive their appropriate responses. But really, this is... Uh, in terms of a shape, this resembles a man in the middle attack, which makes a lot of sense. The good news is this is still the only class of shape that results from running CPSA against this protocol. So if we deploy it on a private network with MTLS, things appear to work from the client perspective. 
and that's good. Now, if you were to deploy this, by the way, without encryption between the proxy and the server, it might work in a private network, but let's move on to a public network. So this is the MTLS public network model from the client perspective. Note this doesn't change, and that's actually good. It means that MTLS is doing its job and we could conceivably deploy the proxy and the server across a network that is more public in nature. I'm not saying like completely public, but like other entities can access the communication between the two. So you could have a remote proxy if you were willing to use MTLS between the server and the proxy. <coughs> it is actually quite crucial, by the way, for the server to authenticate the proxy, because if it does not, then this entire protocol explodes, especially on a public network. If the server doesn't know anything about who they're talking to, they are truly oblivious. I mean, not just oblivious in the sense of they don't know that they're participating in SBP, which they don't, but also in the sense that the server doesn't even know, like, it, it, the, the proxy is some arbitrary client, right, instead of the specific client that is acting on other clients' behalf. So MTLS is crucial here if you're going to set it up like this on a public network. So from the client's perspective, it appears that things are mostly okay, and that's great. The issue with this protocol, as is so often the case when doing formal methods analysis, especially using CPSA, is that there is always some perspective that is suffering. So let's look at this from the server's perspective. So the server being truly oblivious sort of has this much uglier view of what's happening. So I want to point out that we now have this third protocol participant here. This is an embedded proxy model, by the way. This is the server and the proxy are one entity here. So we now have the network. The network is going to take part in this protocol. And it's not to do anything good. It's to do something evil. So the server is going to talk to the network. That is to say, the network is going to initiate a session of SPP with the server. And that makes perfect sense. That's allowed in the DY model. And they're going to establish the TLS 1.2 session. And normally now the network and the server will complete the protocol, but the network has other ideas. The network is going to concurrently start another session of SPP with a client, some actual client, a legitimate client, hopefully not you. And so this client is going to follow the protocol. So the client, having established this TLS channel with the network, is going to present some username. In this case, it's the client's legitimate username, which we're going to call username tax zero, a password. It's going to encrypt it under the client write key, send it to the network. Well, the nice thing about the network is that it has the client write key because it negotiated this TLS session with the client. So the network now knows the username and the password, as far as the server knows, right? And what the network can do is it can substitute any arbitrary username and password. So by the way, we're, we don't even need to assume that these are, that the network and the client are trying to talk to the same service, but this is why you shouldn't use the same password for different services. Because in this instance, the network receives the password for some username from the client. It's not gonna substitute it for an arbitrary different username. Could be the same one, could be a different one. But the point is we know this password because of how this is set up. And by the way, for this to be possible, a network would have to issue a legitimate client, um, certificate to the client. But this is, again, possible. We have seen rogue services with legitimate seeming certificates, so not entirely implausible. And the network is now going to complete a session with the application server and the proxy using a password that isn't theirs. So basically, they are attacking somebody's account. And the implications of this can be pretty far reaching. I mean, let's go back to the Blackboard example that motivates SBP. So in the case of Blackboard, if I'm able to authenticate as a professor, for instance, and I'm in their course or somebody I know is, what I can do is I can slip in a little grade book and I can make changes. So, I mean, there are, and this is a fairly benign example in some sense. I mean, if you get into somebody's banking account, for example, you could do far more damage depending on the bank and their systems. By the way, this is undesirable from the server's perspective, and the protocol does not prevent this from the server's perspective. And the server, you know, is going to just complete this protocol with a network because the network is also a legitimate communicant in some sense. Well, I say legitimate. It's a real communicant, definitely not legitimate in the sense that the objectives aren't legitimate, right? And the network receives a login response and receives this bound cookie. So that's the issue. We've bound the cookie to the channel between the server and the network, but that cookie corresponds to a password that the network shouldn't have. And then the network can use this cookie to, you know, author like authenticate requests going forward. So this is bad. And this is in the embedded model. 
one of the major reasons this happens is because TLS has this one way authentication. So the server can't authenticate who they mean to talk to. And really in this protocol, they can't authenticate anything because they have no notion of what client network entity matches up to like a username and password. So really it's not a great situation. And this situation is reflective of most of the internet, unfortunately. So if we get into the, so I will warn you that the next few, the next two shapes are quite large. So don't panic when you see them. But when we get into the sort of uh, standalone proxy models, we have a similar issue. That is to say, the communication between the server and the proxy are going to be just fine. So the server and the proxy will complete a session of MTLS, uh, derive these encryption keys, and then any messages exchanged between the proxy and the server are fine. The issue now is that the proxy is getting attacked by the network, much in the same way as we saw before. So it just shifts the problem one entity over. So the proxy is doing a good job of protecting the server here, but the proxy itself is also struggling with this one-way authentication nature of TLS. And certainly there's some other issues as well. One of the issues with the bound cookie that I want to talk about is that the cookie binds to this TLS master secret for the channel between the proxy and the network in this instance, and some system private key that nobody knows, which means that the only entity that can verify the binding of this cookie ever is the proxy. When you're binding values, it is actually ideal if the server and the client can also verify the binding of this, of this value. For instance, if the server knows that it should be talking to a certain entity, which in this case it doesn't, by the way, but if you're going to design sort of something more robust here, you'd want some way for the server to verify this binding and certainly for the client to do so as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit because there's some unique issues with that specific to actually SVP and wrapper protocols. But to summarize, the standalone proxy MTLS private network model has the same problem. TLS only authenticates one way, so from the server's perspective, we really can't ever trust whatever the proxy or the server, if the proxy is embedded, is receiving from the network. If we remove the private network aspect, we still have the same situation. MTLS, it turns out, works. So that's good. So where do we go from here? So I want to now introduce this notion of cookie authenticity. So earlier when I showed you a flowchart of sort of how we do things with CPSA, <coughs> it's, it's fine to present these shapes, but what we'd really like to do is we'd like to prove some security properties of this protocol or show that they don't hold with counter examples, which by the way, those shapes that you saw the last three that would constitute counter examples for cookie authenticity. So I'm going to very informally state like a high level cookie authenticity goal from the client's perspective. For the server's perspective, you just mess with some of the strands that you're referring to. And this is a proof, uh, sorry, a goal within the strand space model. So if we assume, and I'm going to translate this all to English, let's, let's specify a goal here. So if we assume that the private key of the proxy, that is to say the proxy's encryption key for TLS is, is not known to the adversary, and the private key of the certificate authority, this is really important. We have to assume that the certificate authority issuing the certificate is legitimate and not the adversary certificate authority, because if that's the case, well, then we have a lot more problems. TLS just completely breaks down at that point. It doesn't even do one way authentication. Now it's not doing anything basically. And so from the client's perspective, if the client assumes that the proxy's private key and the Certificate authorities private key are non-originating. All that means is that the adversary does not have them and never will. And if we assume that the TLS values, so like the pre-master secret, the client random, the server random, these values specific to a session of TLS between a proxy and a client are unique for that session. And we assume that the client hasn't used a common password or has leaked their password to somebody else. And we assume, last but not least, that C prime is the bound cookie, which we called BC earlier. I should have called it BC here. That presumably incorporates the legitimate cookie from the server, the, the fresh cookie for the client. Then we say that two properties must hold, assuming that all these things are true. And the first property is that for any legitimate client strand, there's a say a client communicant, there exists a legitimate proxy strand and a legitimate server strand that agree on C prime and more importantly, the incorporated value of C in that bound cookie. And 
property two is maybe more important. There does not exist any strand for which this is not the case. So that means that is to say CPSA can't find a counter example or a situation in which there is a legitimate client strand and some other proxy and server strand where they don't agree on the bound cookie. So the bound cookie is the crux of this protocol. It's everything revolves around it. And you can state goals like this from a server perspective as well. And it's relatively straightforward to extend this goal to each variation of deployment too, which is what we do. And what we find is that from the client perspective, as you sort of saw in the shapes, the, go the goals hold. So if the embedded proxy model the goal, goal holds for standalone proxy in a private server, it holds and for standalone proxy in a public server, it holds. I want to point out that it does not hold at all if you have the proxy and the server communicate on a public network without MTLS. That action goes very badly. But it's also, also sort of not, not a reasonable way to deploy SPP. The issue is the server is oblivious. So the server is an oblivious protocol participant, and thus it's just impossible within the DUI model to achieve certain things. And the one way nature of, TL, MT, of TLS is contributing a lot to this, actually, in the sense that the server really doesn't know who the client is. So from the server perspective, we can't, we, we find counterexamples for all three of these goals. And I showed you the shapes that are the counterexamples above. So the server is oblivious. That's a problem. Is there anything we can do about it? This protocol is designed to wrap an to wrap a server that is not doing its job, basically, in terms of authenticating users or defending against certain attacks. So it's a third party system that you can't modify, which is very, very common now. Most companies, organizations, universities are using many third party systems like Blackboard, WebEx, you could go on, right? You can list hundreds of these that they don't control. So if there's suddenly some vulnerability that gets published from one of these things, you're basically waiting for a patch. And if the company decides not to patch it, which for instance, they ran into this problem when they developed SPP with their Blackboard instance, then what do you do? You either have to throw the whole system in the garbage or you have to come up with a solution yourself. It seems like right now, the best we can do is to wrap the system with something to help protect it. And a side effect of that wrapping is that almost by design, the system you're wrapping is going to be oblivious to it. So it's an inevitability of this sort of wrapping approach to security. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? Probably not, right? SPP does meaningfully improve the security of the Blackboard instance that they wrapped. So let's get into some of the broader issues. The main issue is that the server really has no idea what's happening. The server thinks it's communicating with a normal client using HTTPS in this case, right? We're using TLS. And it does not know about the SPP session that's happening. What this means is that the server cannot contribute in any way, shape, or form to the security of SPP. Not really, not, not directly anyway. For instance, I talked about this notion of cryptographic binding earlier. Cryptographic binding is really, really important for stopping men in the middle attacks. It requires the participation of everyone in the protocol to work correctly. The server doesn't know it's taking part in the protocol and therefore cannot create, verify, apply, any bindings, and that's a huge problem in the, in the DY model. The server and the client can't verify that cookie either, and that's actually by design. Normally, to verify a binding, you need the original value that you're binding. And the issue is if we give the client the original cookie, then we're right back to square one. The whole reason SVP exists is because it, it was possible using cross-site scripting, also abbreviated XSS quite often, to steal the, the cookie from the client. So the reason this works here is because now the only cookie the client has is bound to the communication channel between the client and the proxy, which means that if you steal that, it's not gonna work when you use it because you're gonna have a different TLS channel, presumably. The issue is if you give the client the original cookie, then we're back to square one. And if the adversary finds some way to communicate directly with the server, they can just issue that original cookie. So we don't actually want the client to know the original cookie. So this is a sort of interesting scenario that's not at all typical in, in full methods protocol design. TLS authentication being one way is not a specific problem for SPP, but it's like a broader problem that we see affect almost every protocol we analyze that uses TLS. In reality, if we want to build an internet where we can, you know, prove that, that many things aren't possible, we need two-way authentication between the entities. How we achieve that 
is, is subject to debate. Certainly, one solution is to give every single person their own certificate and then to have use MTLS for every connection. That seems a bit tough. There's like, I think over 20 billion devices on the internet. It might be way more than that. It might be an order of magnitude off even. And for certificate authorities to manage that many certificates, I mean, it might get quite wild. I'm not saying it's impossible, but there's probably a reason it hasn't happened yet. And on top of that, certificates cost money. So not every single person would have to pay a fee to basically use the internet uh, when we're trying to go towards sort of the internet being more open public service kind of thing. Wrapping systems, by the way, also can create new problems. So at UMBC, at some point, we took all these legacy systems and we decided, let's give these single sign-on. You know, single sign-on is better. We can manage the credentials better. There's all these benefits to doing so. But a problem that we created in the process is the sign-off issue. Most of these legacy systems, they don't really know when a session ends. In fact, like the notion of a session ending or expiring isn't always present in some of these systems. So as a result, even when you sign off, you know, via the single sign on system, you might have these zombie sessions that remain with many of these third party or legacy systems that just sit there. And those sessions could be ripe for exploitation under some circumstances. So coming back to this idea of like improving the SVP binding, an obvious improvement to it would be to make it possible for at the least the client, which knows about the SVP session to verify the binding. Now the problem is we can't give the client the original cookie, as I just explained. So we need to find some way to do this using a zero knowledge proof. So this is sort of something we'll be working on in the coming months. And it's, it's a primitive that surprised us or it certainly it surprised me because when I sort of started working on cryptographic binding and, and formal methods protocol analysis, I never imagined there'd be a protocol where you A, have a server that doesn't know it's taking part in the protocol at all. And B, you have a client that needs to verify a binding without receiving the information that's found. So this, this protocol, while obscure, is very interesting. Um, SPP has been sort of one of the most interesting protocols we've seen actually. Also, I find it hard to believe that SVP is the only wrapper protocol out in the wild of this form. There must be other ones. I'd like to start looking for them uh, a bit more proactively so we can see how other protocols are doing this and if these problems are specific to SVP or as we suspect more endemic to this style of protocol. So the wrapper protocol problem uh, because every wrapper protocol will by necessity have an oblivious protocol participant usually. I can't really think of a counter example. And then we have a bunch of related work ongoing with this, where we're dealing with cryptographic binding. And what we're doing is we're applying binding automatically to two party CPSA strand space models. That's a cool project that I'll be talking about in December, I think. But yeah, so this is this little this little obscure protocol turned into really a quite fun research project. And we learn we've learned a lot from it, and we're continuing to learn a lot from it. And we're sort of wrapping up a paper now that we'll be submitting to ACNS in sort of in late October. And certainly once sort of once our draft is looking a little bit better, anybody here who wants to take a look at it is certainly welcome. So with that in mind, does anybody have any questions for me? Hi, my name is Brandon and I actually had a question about the protocol analysis like workshop that you were referencing earlier. Uh, is how can we get like more information about that? So there's there's basically two things you can do. The most expedient direct way is to email me. I can put my email back up on the first slide if you want. Would that be helpful? So just shoot me an email. And I'm sort of going to start. I'm slightly behind on this, but I'm going to take all the emails I've received and I'm gonna start organizing workshops. And that'll be for October. So. And I'm, I'm happy to work with students with any background, even if you've never done computer security before. I've, we've taught high schoolers how to use this stuff. Um, admittedly, very, very good high schoolers. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Protocol analysis is a lot of fun and you do get to learn a lot of interesting stuff doing it. So I think your interest is warranted. Yeah, great, thank you. What practical advice do you have for uh, IT administrators who have to deal with legacy software with these sort of problems? So 
Practical advice. Well, the, the most practical advice I have is get comfortable with wrappers. Because what we're seeing is a massive, massive increase of breaches that are like most breaches now in in company computer systems are the result of some legacy system or some third party system getting cracked with the known vulnerabilities. So the reality is that we're now dealing with systems that are these huge combinations of other systems. Um, and, and really, it, it, the problem feels almost intractable on some level and, and certainly a solution where we can formally verify everything. At the, from the protocol perspective seems out of reach right now. But SPP is like a necessary evil, basically. I mean, it's a lot better than just having the Blackboard server sitting there screwing up. So I, I would say get comfortable with this idea of partitioning networks into these virtual local area networks and, and you know, make sure that any system that you're worried about or any system you know has issues is residing inside of some sort of wrapper system. And, and so if the IT administrator secures the connection between the server and the proxy, um, how good is that solution? It's pretty solid. Um, we're still dealing with the other issue that the proxy itself may have trouble authenticating clients because of the one way nature of TLS. That's a broader problem that really goes beyond the scope of even what we're doing here. That's like the whole internet is kind of screwed up because of this. For that, I don't have any practical advice because you, your clients aren't going to have certificates. So the best you can do right now is you can make sure that the adversary has absolutely no way to interfere with the communication between a proxy and the server. And you can use formal methods to verify that, which we have here under those deployments. So are there any uh, more questions? Yes. What was the goal? for the server side perspective uh, with respect to authentication? Like, was, that, was it on the slides? No, no, no. So I gave one example. The goal from the server would be very similar though. Instead of the client's assumptions for the keys, you'd have the server's assumptions. Um, and of course the server has sort of more constrained assumptions because it doesn't know about everything, but certainly we assume the server knows the proxy's public. It, uh, key, for example, and that that public key is not compromised. So you'd state the goal in a similar way. The goal is in the paper if you want to take a look at it. Okay, thank you. But it's still, it still revolves around the authenticity of that, specifically the authenticity across the different communicants for that bound cookie, right? And for the server's part, the server perspective is most interested in does that bound cookie use the cookie I generated, right? That's a major question because if it doesn't, well, there's something else going on. But thanks for that question. Well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you for giving a nice stimulating talk. We'll be back in one week when RJ will be speaking about some of his recent work on malware analysis. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll be back in December. <laughs>